So I'm going to talk about a paper we wrote uh, recently. It's 3D partition functions in Kivara Sora. It has been written together with Anton Nedelin, who is doing his first postdoc in Milano, and with Fabrizio Nieri, who is doing his postdoc in Uppsala. So please, uh, you know, unfortunately, I have to leave tomorrow to US, but please feel free to ask them any complicated questions, and you know, don't ask me. Okay, good. Uh, so let me try to give you idea first, and then I will try to give more pedagogical talk because the subject is rather technical. So I will only outline the, some technicalities, but I will concentrate on the idea. But the thing is the following. So, thank you. Uh, the idea is the following, that in principle, typically, when we discuss, so we do localization. So, for example, we discuss partition function for S3, I don't know, for land spaces, etc. So, for simplicity, I concentrate on 3D partition functions, and maybe toward the end, I will make some comments about 5D. So we calculate these partition functions, and typically, uh, you know, they are functions of very few variables. So they may be functions to be of, I don't know, of uh, rank of gauge group, maybe level, maybe some Kaplan, Faleolopoulos term, but it's a finite. So in a way, to a large extent, it's a number, and you know, it's a, it's a bit boring number, so it's a bit boring to study. Of course, some people concentrate on this number quite a lot. But there is typically some matrix representation, and this guy depends from very few parameters. At the same time, it's not the only quantity we can calculate by localization. We can also calculate uh, typically some set of Wilson loops in some you know, representation. So in matrix model, it corresponds to certain insertion. So in a while, I will make it very precise. But typically, in all discussions, we talk about either partition function, or we talk about Wilson loops, etc. But what does make sense, it makes sense to, put, to take these two objects together and put them into the generating function. So eventually, my zeta t now will depend, of course, on some finite number of parameters, which is related to the theory. But then, typically, it will depend on infinity many guys which people typically call times. It can maybe one set of times, it may be two set of times, etc. And then the claim is the following, that's what I will try to explain, that these guys, in terms of this infinity many constraints, satisfy infinity many many PDEs. Very complicated PDEs, but uh, these PDEs, they have very clear geometric algebraic structure and they're related to Kuber Asura. So this is the idea. And this is this is general pattern in all other dimensions. Uh, again, in some dimensions, people just didn't study. But, you know, for example, in 5D, Nikrasov partition function, that was resolved by Peston from December 15, you can do the same thing. And it will satisfy infinity many algebraic PDs. So in a way, the idea is better not to study this or this object separately. You put them together, and then you write this. So that's what I will explain. And, and the basic idea would be that this object has very clear interpretation in terms of CFT, and this is BPS-CFT correspondence. OK, so before I go there, I assume that you, you guys don't know much. So I will just outline your idea of what Vera Sora constraints, and then tell you some basic stuff about Q Vera Sora constraints, etc. So typically, all these guys are matrix integrals with different measure. So when I'm giving you integral, typically, right? So if I write for you the integral, so I have to calculate the number. OK, this is very cool. You know, you sit down, you calculate it by some means. And typically, for this integral, what people typically write, there is word identities. The TTs, which is basically an insertion of derivative under the integral. Again, it's a true statement, but it's a useless statement because you cannot really calculate anything. So typically, uh, and this is the whole idea here, that instead of calculating this integral or calculating many integrals, you can basically try to reduce the problem to generating function.
So namely, for example, I can, again, I am uh, here very few mathematicians because they ask a lot about convergence, so let's ignore these issues. But I can basically pack infinity many integrals in the following object. Um, let's say t1, t2, etc. And I will write something like this. Minus 1 over 2g x square plus uh, n from 1 to infinity t and xn. So in principle, if this is a reasonable function and there is not uh, much analytical thing, so what I can basically translate this uh, purely uh, analytical problem to this calculating this. Then of course the question, how do I understand this integral? But typically the most natural thing to say that this is just Gaussian weight and then these guys are expand formula and you know I can do the formula and write everything explicitly. So then there are two ways, I mean, for this, this is a very nice toy example. It's good for students to do, but you can basically do this thing in two ways. Uh, so one way you can actually sit down and calculate this integral, for example. It's, it's uh, you know, the only thing to calculate this, you need, you need to know x and power 2p Gaussian, what is equal, and then you expand. Equally, but you can do something else. So you can trade these guys for, you can write infinity many PDEs. So one of the things which I can try to insert there is the fallen operator. So as you can recognize, it's almost Virasora, but the thing is I put this guy up uh, inside. So of course this guy will satisfy the classical Virasora. Then you take this guy, you put inside, and then you get, of course, identity. Very trivial identity. E minus 1 over 2 g x squared plus. So if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Let me put k here. And this is dx equal to 0. Well, now what you do, you just simply uh, differentiate with respect to x everything, and then whatever extra terms you have, you can generate them by taking TK derivatives. And then what you eventually get, if you, yeah. Are you a mathematician? Then why do you ask? <laughs> I, I warn you that, you know, I mean, it's, the thing is, of course, it's conversion. It depends how you understand this integral. I'm, I'm told you how the way you understand this integral. So you treat G as actually positive guys. So this is Gaussian weight, and these guys you just expand formula. For example, this is one way of understanding integral. You are applying differential equations to the integral. No, I'm not there. This is, uh, I mean, this is that level. I mean, we account to three manifold. Nothing to do with this. I'm trying to explain your idea. So typically, you know, the idea is in a way trivial, uh, but you know, as you just make this idea algebraically more and more complicated, it becomes uh, you know much more meaningful. But the idea is very trivial in a way. So instead of calculating integral, so I have integral, I have word identities. This is an empty statement. Now what I'm doing is I'm writing for instead of integral, a generating function for all integrals. Let's forget convergence. Let's forget all these nasty mathematical questions. Let's believe everything works. Okay? And then what I'm telling you that I can just tell you write infinity many these guys. So for example, if I assume that n more than or equal to minus 1, then this guy is equal to 0. Now what I'm telling you that I can do this exercise, I can actually differentiate on the integral, I can write, I will have only powers here of x, and then eventually what I will get out of this, if you want it to be concrete, I will get some differential operators, ln, written in t's and derivative of t's, acting on zeta of t equal to zero. You know, if you want that, uh, just to make sure that I'm not cheating, I can write for you these operators. Again, this is extremely trivial exercise, but uh, in a way, 
So n plus 1 factorial t, tn minus g n plus 2 factorial uh, dt n plus 2 plus, sorry, I forgot here. I, I just decided for convenience because put he k factorial. Again, it's not, of course, important, so. And plus s factorial and then s minus 1 factorial ts d s plus n, something like this. And then you can write, let me not write it, you can write the same for L1, there is operator L minus 1 operator. So what I'm telling you is the following, that this generating function of infinity many variables just killed by these first order differential operators. And you have, and of course, next thing you can ch just check that these differential operators, of course, satisfy exactly the same algebra. So you can check that these operators satisfy the same algebra. Now what you can do, again, the thing is, why do you do it? Because, as I told you, either you try, can try to solve this PD, so you can actually calculate integrals and model uh, some analytical details. What you can get, you can just get this thing. So this is generating function for integrals in one variable. So this is called Bell polynomials. And I mean, they're related to Schur polynomials. Okay, so what the whole thing is the following. You take this integral, either you calculate it, in this case you can calculate it, or you can prove, uh, you can try to derive the value of this integral uh, from various other constraints. Again, there is Obviously, there are sort of constraints not feel fixed normalizations because this is PDEs. I mean, this does not fix the constant value of the integral. But this is the idea of uh, there are sort of constraints, just in a very simple example. Any questions? So the next level uh, of complication, uh, this is our favorite standard Hermitian matrix model. So Hermitian matrix model is the following. Again, this is like 25 years old stuff, but so what I can do for you, I can write for you the following model. Again, I'm introducing, so I will do the integral over UN Lie algebra. So it's a vector space of, uh, so this is a space of uh, Hermitian matrices. So I'm writing Lebesgue measure here. And then I'm writing here minus uh, sum over S zero to infinity TS trace of MS. Again, if you worry about convergence, you can put a Gaussian factor. I mean, you can sort of make things so you can in principle try to uh, look at the algebraic things. So what is obvious is that, I mean, the Gaussian measure over Lie algebra will be invariant on that joint action. So if I send my mu to u dagger mu u, and u now is in u end, so this is invariant. Okay. So there is a very standard exercise that you can just translate this integral to something like this. So this is, again, my infinite times. And then I will have here a product of Rn. So by any Hermitian matrix, by unitary matrix can be diagonalized. So I can basically diagonalize this measure. The only thing I have to keep a track of things like Jacobi, et cetera. So I will have dn lambda, and then here I will have i minus j lambda i minus lambda j square. And then here I will have s from zero to infinity, ts. And then I replace here i from one to n lambda i s. Then again, here what you can do in this simple integral, you can try to repeat exactly the same game. And that's what people did. Uh, so it was one of the speakers who refused to come. I did 
the Russian one. Uh, so Morozov and Mironov, I mean, they did this version of the trick. But you can take these objects, so you would like to calculate, and one of the things you will insert his operator, ln, which would be minus sum i from 1 to n, d, d, lambda i, lambda i, n plus 1. So obviously, this is just classical Verasor. So I have n variables. I just look at the sum of these guys. So you can easily check. Well, there is nothing to check. You know that ln, lm, n minus m, ln plus m. So this is classical Verasor. OK, now I'm not going to repeat the thing, but uh, I will to basically bring you the message. So this guy, this is matrix integral. It has nothing to do with conformal field theory. But then what you do, you do the following exercise, and that's what Mironov with Morozov did in 90 or 91. So in principle, you can put this operator here. You can actually differentiate. You will uh, get some terms. You use some you know, simple combinatorial identities, and eventually you will get that uh, ln on zeta t is equal to 0. Any questions? Okay, uh, and then, so you do this exercise and then you write these operators. So let me write for you these operators very explicitly. So now this is not first order operators, this is second order. So they will be uh, TK, DTK plus second derivative over t0, and then finally this term, ln uh, k from 0 to n, second derivative of t, k dt, n minus k. So this is a second term, etc. So this has come just from word identities so this matrix integral. So typically, you put these guys, it's very obvious why you put here this condition for these powers n more than equal minus 1, because you don't want to mess up this convergence, for example. So now, if you stir for these guys, whoever did a uh, free boson and stir for these guys for a while, then you would realize the following thing. You basically will realize that what you have there, it's a free boson representation. So if I uh, look at my Heisenberg algebra, Heisenberg, okay, and uh, I can, for Heisenberg algebra, I can pick up some representation. And the, the most obvious representation to pick up, again, in my discussions, I'm a bit ignoring zero modes, etc. So basically what I can do, I can choose these guys to be something like square root of n, t, n. So I introduce infinity many variables. So this is my creator operators. So my n is positive. I'm sorry to confuse you, but this n has nothing to do with that n. Okay. And then my creator operators, this is guys which would be just proportional to derivative, something like this. Okay. So this is a representation of Heisenberg. Now, if you pick up this representations up to some numeric, stare at these formulas, what you realize is the following, that this is nothing else. So what you have there, it's the following formula. It's 1 over 2 m from minus infinity to infinity normal ordering of a n minus m a m. Okay. So basically, this is free boson. Yeah. Again, at that time, it was not that obvious. So this, I mean, this integral, you take an integral, you know, just integral over Lie algebra, and eventually this integral, the very sort of constraints related to free boson. So if you now try to think a bit more what you have, so this is what I'm telling you, this is pretty standard thing. I'm just, I will do it more and more complicated in a while, okay? Um, so basically, one of the way of looking at this integral is the following. 
So I introduce my free boson. Okay. And then basically I would like to construct some guys so I can think about these guys as an element, element in a Fox space. For example, I pick up this representation. So, for example, you know, I can construct all my states, polynomials, etc. So, all this, you know, theory of symmetric functions. I mean, can be recasted. I mean, it's related to representation of Heisenberg. So, it's in this Fox space, and then I basically have to construct for you a state which would be annihilated by these guys, etc. So, in a way, this problem already it's related in somehow to singular vector fields. But the very canonical way of doing it is the following. I basically can introduce for you a screening current, which up to the phi of lambda. And the thing is that these guys with these guys behave in very concrete ways. So it's typically ln with s of lambda. This is some derivative of some operator. So it means that if I integrate this guy, so if I do integral of a correct contour, so that derivative vanishes, then this is zero. So this is typically called screening. Uh, so this is current, this is screening charge. Okay. And then what you can think about zeta t. So zeta t for Hermitian matrix model can be thought as the following. That you just take your object, which let me denote. This is let me denote q. So I just take a q and and act on the vacuum. So in this representation, vacuum is just identity. And of course, this is by definition will uh, satisfy Verasoro constraints because Verasoro heat in this, they commute, they heat the vacuum, they annihilate it, this is zero. And in a way, the matrix model, if you will just write this integral, this, you have to do the normal ordering and exactly when you will do the normal ordering of these guys, Sorry. Where here? <coughs> hmm? Right. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's a representation, right? So what I'm saying to you, for you, for example, it's obvious that I can, you know, what I'm saying is the following, that I can write for you a minus 1, a minus 2. This is the same as a polynomial t1, t2, right? That's, that's the sort of statement. It's a representation. It's true in a, in a concrete representation I choose for Heisenberg, okay. So this is in a way one of the way of looking at Hermitian matrix model. And the thing is that whatever matrix model we get, you just have to modify this story somehow and make it more exotic. But this is the idea of Verasora constraints. Any questions? So just fi fi final comment is that when you order these guys, so when you do normal ordering, what you will get, you will get exponent of a sum i not equal to j log of lambda i minus lambda j. This is standard calculation in the CFT, which is, of course, the same as a Vandermond. Okay, I mean, right now, when I, the way I'm presenting it, it's very obvious. 25 years ago, it was not obvious. So now what you can do, so our goal is the following, that our goal eventually to reproduce some measures. So this is very canonical, simple measure. In, uh, in, for example, in localization, we have more and more complicated measures. So the idea, uh, I will first explain you one basic example, and then I will spend time explaining the main result of the paper. But um, one of the things is the following, that we would like here to get a different function, something more complicated. And one of the way of doing this is basically try to deform Verasora. So we'll look at different uh, deformations of Verasora. So let me write this down explicitly. So I will now start to talk about Q Verasora. Or Sora. I'm not uh, going to give you a re any general theory. I'm just and mainly I concentrated on a free field realization, free field realization. But the whole idea, we keep this philosophy from Hermitian matrix model, but we deform Heisenberg, we deform guys, we deform these guys, so they become 
now not quadratic, they become something complicated, but they still satisfy some algebra, and then you get eventually the same thing. So these things still will be true, and you will get something annihilated by these operators. So let me uh, talk about Heisenberg. So now I will deform it by some complex numbers, which I will tell you in a moment. So PQ and just this, this is zero mode sets. So uh, and then, uh, so uh, in general, Q and T can be complex numbers. And there are the following relations. So it depends which numbers you discuss more fundamental. So P is equal to Q, T minus 1. And quite often, you say that T is equal in power Q beta. So either I pick up Q beta, or I pick up Q T, or I pick up, you know, etc. QP, this is just standard things. Okay. Again, the whole idea is now if, if I start, try to for my guy like this, so just think, if I take this formula and I deform my Heisenberg and start to calculate something like this, again, there may be some dif, dif, I mean, modifications, but roughly speaking, I automatically will not get this measure. It will be more complicated. Okay. So let me tell you about free field realization of uh, Q-Verasor and what's how it's related to Verasor. Sorry? Ah, this is just zero modes. It's a you know momentum Q, so I have to have a zero. So the formula which I wrote here, this is for n and m in integers minus zero. So typically, you know, we have to keep a zero mode, so we, t I mean, for zero modes, we have separate guys, so this is some technicality, if you wish. Right, uh, so now, uh, uh, Kivarasura. So this I just take, uh, I postulate, and then what I can do, I can do to write for you the following. So what is q -verasor? So this is basically deforming Verasor, not within Lie algebras, but within associative <coughs> algebras. So this has been done around 95, by a group of Japanese, a lot at all. So let me write the thing and then tell you in what sense it's a Verasora or deformation of Verasora. So you can write this algebra. So I fail is some structure constants, so they come from expansion of concrete functions. But the thing is that you can fix this function by associativity. Okay? So this is fixed fixed by associativity. And then if you now take your Q and try to say EH bar and try to expand this in a uh, up to quadratic order, then you can see that sort of only, so if I write for you the formula, Tn, it will be 2, some constant term plus h bar square beta ln plus q beta square over 4 delta n0 plus terms of order h4. So q beta is just some variation. Okay. So what I'm telling you is the following, that you can write this algebra sounds that you can fix it by associativity, but another requirement is that you would like in quadratic order in H bar, these guys will be actual Verasora. So this is it's called Verasora. So you deform Verasora within associative algebras. Well, this is basically a W algebra. Okay. So of course you can ask uh, the following question: How to write uh, these guys? So 
you can write concrete ansatz for these things. And uh, so this is L plus of zeta plus L minus of zeta. And uh, this L plus minus zeta is um, So I'm just writing to give you an idea. Zeta n minus n, 1 plus p minus plus uh, n, a n, normal order in q, plus minus uh, square root of beta, 2 capital P, p plus minus uh, 1 half. So this is free field realization. So again, it's a computation which has been done by Avat et al. That if you take this Heisenberg, you know, you write these guys, you take these guys. Of course, you expand them over sum over T n zeta minus n. You can see that T n satisfies this relation. Of course, this relation can be written in many different forms. And I'm not writing for, but this is a coefficient of expansion of very concrete f uh, function. Okay, it's a cuvera sort of. Good. Then next thing you can mimic in Hermitian matrix model, you can write also the analog of uh, screening current. So screen current is given by the following formula. So just one comment for you right away that you realize. If I want to now look at these guys as a differential or, or operator, so Although this uh, Heisenberg is deformed, I still have a canonical representation of Heisenberg. I mean, in a way, you c it depends on your test. I may say that I'm not deforming Heisenberg. I can put all these coefficients inside of this AN. And then my complication will <coughs> pop up here. So, I mean, it's a Fox space. It's the same Fox space. I just have an action of totally different object there. But you, so you s up to these factors which you can put in definition, I can still write AN for positive n as a uh, derivative in t, and this is, is just a multiplying with negative uh, n as a multiplying t. So now if you look now at these guys and you put here your operator, so you put your representation in derivatives, etc., you can see that the operator is horrible, but of course it's well defined. But in principle it's exponent, exponent of differential operator. So these guys in the representation of Heisenberg, it's up only quadratic guys. This becomes now a very complicated operator, but it's totally well defined. There is ordering problem is solved, etc. So now I'm writing for your screening charge. So again, it's some expression. And then here E so beta Q W. And the whole thing is done because I would like to mimic exactly what I had before. So if you do the calculation, then the thing is that Tn this SW is equal to, now it's a difference operator. So I'm not specifying this, so this is always a sum operator. But this is almost, it's a Q derivative. Okay. So you can calculate this, so we don't care. Important thing that if I take a correct contour, sorry, W. So if I take a correct contour, so what is very obvious is the following, that if I take a correct contour for integration, then of course, this is zero. Simply in this integral, I can change instead of QW, I multiply here, I change variables in this integral, nothing, so this is the same integrals. Again, the thing is that you have to think about the contour, but let's say we take a contour, which is, so it means that if I integrate these guys, so if I integrate these guys of appropriate contour, then I will get that this is equal to zero. So from this point of view, I can repeat exactly the same game I did before.
There is some subtleties, zero modes, etc. I'm not going to discuss them. But now what I'm telling you that I can take uh, my integrals, roughly speaking, uh, so in power n, put on the vacuum and get something. Okay? So I get something, and then uh, I'm saying that this something, uh, if I call it zeta, so this something will be annihilated automatically by this positive. So let's ask what is this, so you can actually calculate. So this is, I'm going to write for you the thing explicitly. So my zeta of t looks as follows. And that's when three manifolds and gauge theory will enter in a moment. So this is just some complicated but straightforward calculation. So what I have, I have, I have some contour integral of our origin, i from 1 to n, dwi, 2 pi i, wi. Then I have here n from 0 to infinity. Uh, OK, let me write this in these notations and then w. Um, <coughs> So i not equal to j, w i divided by w j, q infinity, w i divided by w j, t, q infinity, and then here I will have my t, uh, k, k running from 1 to infinity, i from 1 to n, w i, k. So how do you get this integral? What you do, you write your screening charges. So this comes from the measure. So this guy is identified as exactly with uh, my screening charges in power n acting on the vacuum. So this comes from normal ordering. And this is just my generating function. This is creator operators in my conventions. So you still have them there. So I mean, these guys still act on the vacuum. I mean, this is a generating function. And this comes from the normal ordering. So is everything clear? The symbols are always clear. Do I have to define them? Is it just my normal measure? Right, exactly. Everybody understand what's written here, right? Let's assume so. Okay, good. But now the thing is that when you stare at these guys, what you realize is the following. That this is, in fact, a, a partition function. For UN theory, for n equal to UN theory plus adjoint chiral, is mass m on the following geometry. So t, uh, so it's a disk, which is you currently rotate. So it's a two disk times circle. And the parameter t, it's roughly exponent of the mass. So this is a, a, so in a way what one can say right away then if you know, again, it's identification. But the statement is the following. If I would turn things around, if I will put Wilson loops around, along S1 circle and put them all in generating functions here, then I will get uh, a sum object which would satisfy infinity many constraints. So this a lot of relation to McDonald polynomials, etc. I'm not discussing it here. Okay. What is important here is identification of this object with this object. Again, when I'm saying partition function, I might actually mean a generating function. Okay. So now let me explain the main result here, and that's what I'm doing. So I'm interested in a compact manifold. So let me start with S3. So for S3, if I take the theory, so I'm taking n equal to un theory plus adjoint uh, chiral of mass m. 
So it's, it's generalizable to modular theories. I'm just looking at simple examples. Mm -hmm. So my partition function would look as follows. It's IRN, and I will have a DNX, and then I will have here I not equal to J. Then there is this double sign. So my S is squashed. So what I'm thinking about my guy is omega 1 of zeta 1 square plus omega 2, uh, sorry, omega 2, zeta 2 square equal to 1. So xi minus xj w1 w2. And then there is s2 m plus xi minus xj omega 1 of omega 2. And then typically here, so let me be more pedantic and try it for you explicitly. Yep. Nothing special. The thing is you do what you can do. So this is a thing. I mean, I'm going to, uh, so uh, unfortunately, you know, there is, if you want to go to concrete things, if, just let me make comments. So the results were explicitly has been calculated. There is closed form. It's S3. It's a length space. It's S2 times S1. <coughs> so this is, on the market exists concrete formulas, and uh, you can take them. And the statement is that I will tell you that all this generating function will be uh, killed by two copies of commuting various or constraints with appropriate way of identifying parameters. Now, what is up to the catch, and this is for any postdocs, PhD students, or even senior staff, I mean, n equal two theories exist on Seifert. So it's a result by Festucci, Dimitrescu, and others. So you can put n equal two on Seifert, but there are no uh, formulas here, explicit. Because one thing that you have a supersymmetry, another thing is to calculate a matrix integral, take into account all flat connections. So in principle, we would believe that we should be able to do something here, but you know, nobody. So S3, it's because people calculate it. And we can sit down, there is concrete formulas and do it. But in principle, I mean, this is up to catch. I mean, one should be able to produce formulas for Cypher. And Cypher really means a circle bundle Right. Up to some or default. I mean, it's locally free U1 action. Absolutely. So this is huge class of manifolds, and people proved that there is an equal to supersymmetry, but nobody dared to write the concrete matrix integrals. Well, maybe exception Simons, but again, there is a lot of issues here, etc. So. No, they are much better than Rushi Tichin to arrive. So this is all the story secretly related to complex Chen Simons. So this is, I mean, this is some upgrade. And, but again, this type of theory is not yet well defined. It's up under discussion. But secretly, it's related to complex Chen Simons. Absolutely, yeah. So I, I don't, I don't want to discuss this subject because it's outside of my scope. But secretly, sort of adding the mass, you know, having UN, this is somehow should be identified with the complex chain assignment, etc. So there is this discussion in the literature. But it's not very conclusive. I mean, there is no clear cut answer. And maybe question, but Z equals Z equal to? Absolutely, yeah. It's specified. So the rank of this guy tells me how many integrals I have. So then if I take another, you know, theory, then I have integrals. So this is like this, and then what I wanted to write, I still have at least to have time to explain your result. But, um, and here, of course, what you will have, for example, you will have standard these terms, minus i pi k2 of omega 1, omega 2, x i square plus uh, 2 pi i k1 omega 1 over omega 2 xj. So this is this guy's Chen Simons level. This is Fallier Lopus, for example. So now what we want to do with you, we would like to uh, put Wilson loops, but we have to think how to put Wilson loops because we would like to uh, put a su supersymmetric Wilson loops. 
So it's important in this logic that I'm choosing my omegas to be generic. So there is, will be a lot of algebraic degeneration when they're rational, etc., etc. So I choose them generic. If I choose them generic, there is only two supersymmetric Wilson loops I can put. One Wilson loop is when zeta 1 equal to 0, and it will have this periodicity. And another Wilson loop here, it will have this periodicity. What I'm saying is it's not true if omegas are rational. I can have torus nodes, for example. But if I choose them generic, then... Uh, that's what I will have. And then it means that, for example, if I want to put a Wilson loop, then I have to insert in the integral correspondingly the following guy. So I have to insert, for example, trace in some representation of my uh, exponent of 2 pi i x over omega 2, for example. Is it just like no, no, well, it's, it's basically, if I think about, uh, uh, you know, uh, S3, S1 fibration, it's only two loops which sits over north and south pole of S2, right? So this is, I mean, this is the only thing. But this is what supersymmetry is telling me. Um, so either I put this guy or I put another guy. And I would like to write a generating functions for both of them. So either I put these guys or I put, so this is representation one, I could equally put in another representation 2 pi i x of omega 2. And of course, these guys is nothing as a sure polynomials in, uh, dependent from the exponent, r1, r2. So if I want to get a Wilson loop, I just put a sure polynomial here. And then there is the standard formulas, which I'm going to use it if I have a sum of all shores. Uh, let me call them S. I think this is more canonical. So, uh, so if I write this, uh, T hat S R W, this is equal to exponent of N more than 1, T N J W J N while these TNs are related by formal change of TK at N over N. Sorry, uh, la, la. T, right, things like this. Right, so that's what I'm doing. Now what I would like to, for you to uh, introduce a generating function. So my generating function will depend on two set of times, T and T prime. So how I define this? I define this as a sum of a two set of representations. And then I will have S of R1 of T hat, S of R2 T hat prime. And then I will have my integral, which I had before, with insertion of, uh, so I will have D and X. I will have my measure. So this guy is exactly this measure constructed out of double signs. Then I have my he exponent. Okay. And then I have corresponding Wilson loop, R1, E2 pi I X of omega 1. And then I have S of R of omega 2. So I would like to have a generating function for all Wilson loops, supersymmetric Wilson loops. So if I do it and I use this formula, then eventually what I will get, I will get the following integral. So my measure, my E, uh, W, X, J. And then here I will have correspondingly exponents of uh, N more than zero, T, N. Uh, then I will have J from one to N e 2 pi i x j of omega 1, and then I have an t n prime, now j from 1 to n, e 2 pi i x over omega 2. So I have to have two times if I want to have keep track of all these loops. So this is my object, so let me now tell you the answer, the main result for the, this object. So 
So let me for simplicity choose my Chen Simons level equal to zero. It just for simplicity, result looks simpler. So in principle, uh, one can generalize it appropriately. Uh, so now I told you that I can write for you this operator, as I wrote before in some representations for t and t, t prime. So I will have to free field realization for q or I'm now looking that these guys is more than equal zero. So these guys by construction are commuting because this is used different times. The statement is the following, that these two guys, Tn will kill this function. So this is a priori, let me also put here prime. So this is a different operator. So again, I, I'm repeating that this guy, there is no really obviously symmetry because this co all enters with this periodicity, this enters with another periodicity. Now what is important that this is not identical algebras. I mean, they have a different parameters. So let's write, let me write for you the parameters. So if I'm writing for you the thing, so I have two copies. Copy one and copy two of my Verasura. And in gauge theory, I have the following parameters. I have my squashing parameter for the sphere. I have a mass, etc. So then correspondently, copy one, this Q1 will be the following. It's a e2 pi i omega of omega one. So omega is just omega one plus omega two. And T is equal, T1 is equal to Q1 and power B, and it's equal to two pi, uh, two pi i capital M of omega one. And then Q2 is equal to two pi i omega of omega two. T2 is equal to Q2 beta two pi i m over omega two. Okay? So this is your glutuk virasora and uh, this is the following uh, relation of um, guys. Again, I'm repeating what is quite unique here. This is just one integral. It's not two integrals. I mean, the statement will be obvious if they will be two integrals. So if I took my result from before, when I got Virasora, then it will be. The thing is, here the trick works because these parameters are glued in a very, very particular way. So if you start to think geometrically, so if you think that Q1 is equal to 2 pi i tau, so tau is just here, it's a ratio of omega of omega one. Then my Q2 is just equal to the following things. It's a minus two pi i tau, tau one minus tau. So this is a some element of SL to zeta. And this is exactly element uh, which you will use when you will glue S3 out of uh, solid tori. For example, if I will, I mean, the same statement will be true. The measures will be different. The integral is different. But the same things, for example, true for length spaces. For length spaces, you will put here R, etc. Now, what is important, the trick that these two commuting guys live together nicely, it doesn't work. So I cannot really take two results and reduce two integrals to one integral, etc. So the whole trick, it works nicely only when the parameters of Verasora of two Kivras or glued by SL to zeta. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So I have no time to explain for you the details, but uh, this is the idea. So this is the main result. And of course, I skipped for you a lot of uh, technicalities. And what I would like to stress at the moment that it may appear trivial result, but it's not trivial result. And the thing is because of uh, screening charges. So when you prove it, of course, you will start to prove it by uh, basically by gluing uh, two free bosons and thinking that, you know, if I take one free filter realization, I take another free filter realization, everything works. So I can uh, basically repeat for your story. I can take Tn, I will write for you a screen and charge one. I will take another Tn prime. I will write a screen and charge two. And then somehow what is obvious is that you would like, for example, now to construct S1 tensor S2. But don't forget they would depend from the same guy. So when I will act this by Tn, 
So of course, Tn will act on this. So I will get D of S1. So this is my Q difference operator. Q difference operator. Tensor S2. On S2, it does not act. I will use totally different free bosons for representation of this guy. But the thing is, this is not good because I cannot put under the integral because this is not equal to D on S1 times S2. So I mean, the standard stupid trick of just gluing two copies, well, it works, but I cannot put this under the one integral. Of course, if I he will have here X, here Y, and integrate, then there is no problem. It's really a copy, but I would like to do one integral. And because of this property, it's not good. But the magic is the following, that if the parameters of this theory are just in such a way that this D acts trivially here, then this becomes true. And this exactly happens when you will, it will be glued by SL2 zeta transformations. Okay? So uh, I have to finish, but let me just say a few things. So it can be generalized uh, to these cases, LR and some two versions of S2 times S1. Why we don't do other manifolds? Because there are no explicit formulas for this. So, for example, we can maybe come up with some ways of gluing uh, currents, etc. but we have no measure to compare. So it's simply there are no gauge theory results. So this is one comment. Second comment, you can generalize everything. So in fact, the theories which uh, one can do, one does not have to do your own theories. It's the theories which is extensively considered. It's their 3D cousins uh, considered by Peston, by Nikrasov, it's the squiver type theories. So in principle, you can have a UN node, and then you have a matter. The only thing we always have to decorate our UN theory by some adjoint to have a M. And this is responsible for T parameter. In principle, you can go to the limit when T goes to one. So there is rounds, a lot of things that will correspond to certain degenerations of the algebra. Some of them studied, some of them not studied. So, for example, uh, one can generalize this to ABG mob. And, um, the only thing is, if, if you would like to see full algebraic structure, you have to take two nodes. So you will have these guys by fundamentals, but they also have to decorate by a joint. If I don't want this adjoint, there is a certain value of M which I can do it. But in principle, uh, so there will be this diagram, queer diagram. So Peston constructed for this diagram, the W algebra. Uh, so there will be these two copies. So if I construct this deformed IBGM for general values for squash sphere, so partition function, generating function will be annihilated by two commuting copies of this queer W algebra, which was constructed by Peston, etc. For all the theories, it works. It's first generalization. Second generalization, uh, of course, everything, all the theories can go on to all these three type of manifolds. Um, you can include, of course, Chen-Simons level, which corresponds to insertion of some vertex operators. So the rest of our constraint becomes a bit more complicated. Okay. Uh, so I have to finish, but uh, basically what we see now here in details is uh, uh, some remains of uh, 5D picture. So in principle, uh, the screening charges which I wrote, it's the same screening charges which were used by Peston in his December paper. So in principle, one can write a 5D Nikrasov partition function for the skewer type theories roughly speaking, as a Jackson integrals. So this is symbolic things, as a Jackson integrals of infinity many copies acting on the vacuum. So that's a test result. So this is a representation. The thing is that, in principle, what you do now, you talk about generating functions, and it will be annihilated by infinity many constraints. So of course, this is known R4 times S1. This is the result with the best one. It's uh, December 2015. So, for example, one would expect here that uh, you can glue so similar things. We sort of it's under consideration. We don't know, but uh, one can also, I mean, for the compact manifolds, you will glue uh, things um, 
there also. The only thing that apparently, if you think for a while, the correct notion of modular double for Q vera Sora, it should not involve not SL to zeta, it should involve SL3 zeta. And the thing is, because vera Sora, Q vera Sora automatically has the symmetry of Q and T. So it means if you take this picture and you impose symmetry about QT, you have to generate full SL3 zeta. And that's exactly how you, on general five manifold single partition functions, etc. But again, it's something very speculative and remains to be understood, etc. Uh, but for example, the result, which is sort of obvious from Peston, that a partition function on S5 for generating function will be annihilated by three commuting copies of Q Veras or these are parameters which you can read from geometry. So I have to stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>